Hello and welcome to another episode of Podcast DX, the show that brings you interviews with people just like you whose lives have been changed by a medical diagnosis. <clears throat> Ron will not be with us today. But I'm here and I'm Jean Murray. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I'm Lita. Collectively, we're the hosts of Podcast DX. On today's show, we're talking about the complex world of chronic illness with Audrey. Audrey is going to be explaining uh, sick sinus syndrome to us, which we've never discussed on this mm -mm. show. So thank you very much for volunteering to join us. And we're looking forward to hearing all about sick sinus sy syndrome. Although we might not be able to say it. <laughs> it okay. Funny. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. Yeah. Oh, and you're not Ron. No, I'm not Ron. Thank you for letting me know, Mom. <laughs> it's good to know. Um, but Audrey, can you start us off by telling us what is sick sinus syndrome? It's hard to say, but <laughs> no. So sick yeah. sinus syndrome, yeah. um, to put very simply, is when the node or the connection on the back of your heart, basically the connection between your brain and your heart, doesn't quite connect properly. Um, the result is okay. that um, the pace of the heart is no longer being paced. So like it can go too fast or too slow, um, but it doesn't actually like, like if your heart rate is increased, it's usually because you're ex exercising or something. But with sick sinus syndrome, your heart rate isn't necessarily going to increase when you're exercising. It could just increase at a random time, like when you're sleeping or something. And that's primarily what it is. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. What? Yeah. What? What kind of symptoms do you get with that? Uh, what led you to your first diagnosis, and are those symptoms typical? And is it easy to get diagnosed? I. Um, so my symptoms were not necessarily typical, and it was not easy to get diagnosed with sick sinus syndrome. Um, a lot of people experience like fluttering in their chest. And I probably did experience some mm -hmm. of that, but quite honestly, I have a lot of anxiety. So I never really saw it as something that was abnormal. It was just like, well, that's just me feeling panicked about life again. Um, but the primary thing that uh, caused me to get diagnosed was that I started fainting almost every time I stood up. So I was fainting six to 10 times a day, if not more. Um, and... Oh. So I obviously went to the doctor. They ran a lot of different tests to try and determine what was going on. Mm -hmm. But the final test that they ran that um, sort of determined that was a tilt, uh, tilt table test. Tilt, tilt table. table test. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. kind of what determined it. Right. Um, for somebody with my age and like health history especially it is extremely uncommon and it was essentially not even on the table when I started going to seek medical help for it. It was like, well, it, they didn't even mention and, it. And they, mm -hmm. yeah. And they ruled out POTS. They said um, it wasn't I have POTS. POTS as well. Um, but it is separate from mm -hmm. POTS. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, and I, I, I'm just curious, like how they went from the tilt table and then did they do any um, cardiac studies? They did at several cardiac point? studies. The kind of determining factor was okay. when I had the tilt table test, I went asystolic. Um, so my, oh, yeah, there you so go. like okay. that was kind of what set everything apart was just like, that's not traditional POTS. That's, that should not happen with anything. <laughs> like something is extremely wrong with you. So, um, I was just gonna say the tilt table test is like the most boring roller coaster ride on earth. Yeah, unless you're me and I don't, unless you pass yeah. out. Yeah, so yes, they told me when I was having it done that tilt typically they tilt you up and down a few different times. Um, then they'll essentially mm -hmm. give you adrenaline to try and like cause you to pass out. Um, I don't remember anything, I just remember them like kind of coming back to consciousness and then like with paddles ready to like try and get my heart to start again because it had oh. fully stopped oh wow and um wow yeah. so how old were you when you got your diagnosis i was 33 years old i am 35 now 
Okay. Okay. And was there like a triggering event prior to this starting? Um, so yes and no. I was at the time um, trying to get clearance to have a hysterectomy um, because of other health issues that I had. Um, okay. I was um, fainting a lot, but I kind of thought it might be because of anemia, but somehow that was relatively normal. Mm -hmm. uh, but after like talking to my cardiologist and actually several different cardiologists, they've kind of determined that it's a very strange adverse reaction to a flu shot. Okay. So, okay. okay. Yeah. And I have every adverse reaction to everything. So it's, oh, that would be the way that it would work. Yeah. You're extra special in that way. Extra <laughs> special. Yeah. Yes. Although I'm but sure your doctors that, are like, you know, yeah. she's so interesting, <laughs> um, which is something you never want like, doctors to say. You never Sorry, want to be interesting. No. The right, typical right. triggering events are like high blood pressure, being overweight, having like kind of like heart health issues already. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't have any of that. Okay. Okay. And how common is sick sinus syndrome? It is not common. It is extremely uncommon in younger people and even less common mm -hmm. in younger heart healthy people. So like, okay. Um, they never really anticipated this being the issue until they're like, okay. Oh, well, this is quite obviously the issue. And okay. did you have to wear a halter monitor during part of the studies? Um, they, that was actually going to be the next thing that they did after my tilt test. Um, okay. But because the tilt test was so conclusive, they were like, mm -hmm. we don't, we don't even need to do that. Okay. Um, All right. Yeah. And then before you received your diagnosis, have you ever, had you ever heard of sick sinus syndrome? You said it wasn't even something they were considering. It was like the zebra in the room and they were only considering horses. Uh, yeah. Or do you have any friends or family members who have sick sinus syndrome? I had never heard of it ever. Um, okay. um, my mom is a physician's assistant and she actually is a professor oh, okay. of, for physician's assistants. And so typically she's like, well, it could be all these random strange things. Cause that's, you know, mm -hmm. what she does. Um, mm -hmm. And when they diagnosed me with that, she's like, wait, what? I don't, mm -hmm. I've never really encountered that, especially like, Everybody, including my doctor, was extremely shocked that somebody that um, my age, my, like, I used to be a, like, power lifter. So somebody who's considerably healthy and has a healthy diet and every, all of those things are kind of lining up to not have six sinus syndrome then have it. Mm -hmm. So it was definitely okay. not something I'd ever heard of, never considered. I've never mm -hmm. met anybody with it other than me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we hadn't, well, I mean, maybe in the back of my mind, I've heard of it, but we've never known anyone with it, so we assumed it was pretty rare. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, right. Audrey, how have you and your healthcare team decided to treat this condition? Um, so the first thing that in, we did was I got a pacemaker, because obviously I can't, I, I was going a, they assumed because of the way that I was fainting so much that I was going existently every time I was attempting to stand up. Mm -hmm. So um, I got a pacemaker um, and that has helped. Um, I've since gone to several other doctors and they've tried me on a whole lot of different kind of medication. Most of them seem to make things worse. So currently I just have a pacemaker. Um, I have it interrogated every two to three months remotely. And um, I have it adjusted every six months to every year to make sure it's um, meeting the needs of what my heart has. Um, it is, well, typically a pacemaker only paces like a max of 20% of the time. That's an extremely high rate of pacing for a pacemaker. That's what I've been told. I don't know if that's right or not. Um, okay. my pacemaker paces a minimum of 80% of the time it's constantly wow, wow. pacing. Um, wow. yeah, so it's, it's just always like my heart rate is just bananas. Um, I do often wear like I have an Apple watch that I wear all the time. 
So like if I fall that it can help me with that. And that's mm -hmm. something that they've, you know, suggested me wear. And um, mm -hmm. another thing they're like, if you can wear that and see what your heart rate's doing at night, it might help you understand like how you're feeling in the morning. So like I usually wake mm -hmm. up exhausted, but my heart rate usually goes 120, 130 multiple times every night while I'm sleeping. So, you know, that's not oh. very restful. <laughs> No, not um, at all. But my primary treatment currently is simp is just the pacemaker. Um, mm -hmm. I haven't really found any medication that has been beneficial at all, unfortunately. Okay. Well, I think we were thinking more um, when um, Lita was in her 30s, she was in a car accident, and this was the time before airbags and not everyone wore a seatbelt, <clears throat> <laughs> and she hit her, the steering wheel. And started mm -hmm. to have issues, and they went in and they actually ablated the node there because yeah. her heart rate was constantly in the two hundreds, and that was the treatment modality that she had at that time. Um, but this, we are talking, you know, back in the days of carts and wagons. Um, so yeah, things have probably I'm changed not at all. Oh, okay, okay, <laughs> they have changed a little bit. Um, Audrey, what role does health, does fitness and nutrition play? Um, with you now are you able to exercise or is that something that's kind of off the board um I am I generally can't exercise I generally can't do much of anything um that requires me to stand or walk for any considerable considerable period of time um mm -hmm. and like some days that can be like I can't walk for more than like four minutes or five minutes some days it's like mm -hmm. 10 um and that's kind of uh just kind of been my new norm. Um, okay. As far as exercising, other than that, I have recently started doing more like, like I'll do like some Pilates type exercises where I'm laying mm -hmm. down um, or like where I'm sitting in a chair. Um, the primary thing, I can't really hurt my heart. It's not going to do anything to that. And I might, I'm probably going to feel dreadful either way, but I do need to, you know, keep exercising for the health of my, the rest of my body, but I am an extreme fall risk. So I really can't okay. do much like, you know, I couldn't like lift weights like I used to because it's very mm -hmm. likely that I would fall and they'd hit me somehow. Yeah. That's, that would be terrifying. Yeah. 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 So, um, I have pre like since this diagnosis, I've still had some episodes where I fainted. Um, like when my husband's gone, like once I fainted and I hit my head and I had a little spot on my brain where it had bled a little bit. Um, I've bruised myself all over my body. So it's like, it's, I've really had to learn, like, you just really have to be pretty still. Um, yeah, but I do try and keep some movement just to like, you know, keep blood flowing and everything and help with mental health. As sure. far as sure. diet. Um, I've always been a very healthy eater and really because of this, like it is considered heart disease of some sort, which is just weird, <laughs> but, um, mm -hmm. it's not really affected terribly by diet. The only thing that, unless you have a really bad diet to begin with, then you might want to change it. But I eat a very healthy diet. The only thing that I really added into my diet is additional salt. I used to have really low sodium. Um, but, mm -hmm. um, and that helps like pots and it can help with, uh, the sick sinus. And really what kind of tends to happen is if I don't treat the pots, the pots will trigger the sick sinus syndrome kind of okay. seems okay. to be the okay. way that it's working currently. Okay. It might change tomorrow, but who knows? Um, okay. Well, yeah, you got to keep it interesting. Gotta... Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. That's... Uh -huh. Um, I do also just because of other health issues and allergies and stuff, I cook almost all of my own food. So I try to be very, very aware of what I'm eating. Um, mm -hmm. sometimes like I don't have much alcohol, things like that can kind of trigger me feeling worse. Um, but it has, it has been really hard to kind of like narrow down triggers it just kind of feels like sometimes everything's a trigger so but sure. i do my best okay all right 
So I, I was going to ask, what do you think is the most misunderstood aspect of sick sinus syndrome? So I assume the only people that like had made unhealthy choices in their life or like overweight or had high blood pressure, or, you know, had all sort of the kind of like, or had potentially had some sort of accident where they had damaged that node, um, were the kind of people that would have sick sinus syndrome, uh, mm -hmm. or could develop sick sinus syndrome. I also assumed that it wouldn't happen to somebody who was 33. Um, uh, however, it's likely I had it before. Um, it's probably like some sort of weird genetic birth defect because I have fainted regularly throughout my life. It just was, it came to a point when I was about 33 that I was fainting all the time. So I think that one of the things that's really misunderstood is like, it can just happen. Like there, essentially, I just had all the like right things happen at the right wrong or wrong things at the wrong time or whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's how I developed this issue. Um, people often ask when they find out that I have sick sinus syndrome, like, well, did you not eat healthy? Did you like not exercise enough? Did you not do all of these things that they assume like keep your heart healthy. And I ha was doing all of those things. I was exercising like five times a week. I was making all of my own food. I had like those little, you know, meal prep things that it, all of the like super app, I was doing all of the things. Um, mm -hmm. I was actually the day that I got my pacemaker implanted, I was supposed to be at a Olympic triathlon. So like, it's like a 10 mile bike ride, a five mile run and a one mile bike or swim. So like, I had signed up for that because that was something that I was feeling like I could do physically. So I think that that's really the biggest thing that people assume is that, oh, I did this to myself in some way and I didn't. It's just how life is. The other thing that I think is um, really misunderstood is that it's not ever going to get better. I can't make it better. I'm not going to, you know, it's not going to go away. It will get worse throughout my life. Um, I'm really thankful for pacemakers because that makes it like it makes me available. I can be alive because of a pacemaker. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> right, right. And people assume I think that, oh, you have a heart disease or a problem with your heart. If you like, change your lifestyle, then perhaps you can reverse it or get better or the symptoms will get better. And that's just not true with this particular health issue. Like it's okay. It's just part of who I am now. Right, so I think right. those are the two biggest assumptions that I think people get wrong. Okay. Sure. And I, that kind of leads to my question or my next question. Well, I was going to ask, yeah. are you, are you able to work? No, I can't work. Um, I can't drive. I can't go to the grocery store. I can't, I can't do anything without somebody with me at all times. Um, I mean, I can sit in my house. I can do like tiny things like that, but like, um, I get very, very tired very quickly. Um, I, um, yeah, like running, no biking, no walking my dog. Can't do that. Can't, I would probably like, I don't know if I'll ever drive again, but driving is like, not possible because I, I still think mm -hmm. even though I have a pacemaker, mm -hmm. it's just not as right. frequent. Um, the primary thing is that you can't do anything where if you fall, you could be hurt. Like, mm -hmm. right. Which seems right. like, you know, that's almost everything. Um, yes. Yeah. So because it's not necessarily the heart that you have to worry about, it's the result of the fainting, like the fact that mm -hmm. you're not stable. Like if I faint, I'm in the grocery store. What's going to happen? You know, right. I'm going to go to the emergency room again. I don't want to go to the emergency mm -hmm. room again. I also mm -hmm. will go to the emergency room and not have any of my groceries. Um, can't drive because, you know, then if I get in a car wreck, then it's my fault. And the doctor's like, well, we told you not to drive your car. Um, right. right. Can't work because honestly, um, sitting for eight hours is not really yeah, even not, a viable option. Yeah. So, right. Um, basically everything that I used to do normally, I can't do anymore. 
Well, are you able to make any adaptation? So if, say, you want to go to on an outing or an, or to, the, to see an event, um, can you utilize a wheelchair? And this way you're able to enjoy some of the things that you used to do enjoy? Um, I have not yet started using a wheelchair. I typically okay. just kind of, if I'm with my husband or like my mom or my dad mm -hmm. or my brothers, they all kind of are aware of like what to look for. If I start getting wobbly, that's what I call it. I say, mm -hmm. I feel wobbly and they're able to help support me. Um, if I have that, um, I am aware of like an event or something that's supposed to be happening. I will prep for that by like drinking a lot of liquid IV and sleeping a lot. So I feel really well rested. Um, mm -hmm. so those sorts of things make it so that I can do some things. Um, the other thing is I live in Southern Illinois. I live right on the Mississippi river. It's extremely oh. hot and humid and those are really yeah. big triggers for me. So I just don't yeah. mm -hmm. even attempt to do things when it's summer. Okay. It's like, cause. Okay. Do you live near St. Louis? Yeah. I live right outside St. Louis. Okay. Do you want to go see? Uh, do you want to go see Eric Clapton <laughs> in is, September this next is month? The weirdest I know. I know. Ever. Do you, you want to go see Eric Clapton next month? <laughs> it depends on what day. Okay. It's in the middle of the week. Uh, I we I, already have tickets. I already and... have the tickets. I'll send them to you. Yes, I would love to see Eric Clapton. I was going to go with my other daughter, but she can't get off of work. So I'm like, do a podcast, skip tickets to Eric Clapton. What are you going to do? All right. <laughs> I so love Eric Clapton. You're going to Eric Clapton. <laughs> awesome. All right. Great. That, that is, you know, <laughs> this is going to go down in the books as one of the more interesting episodes. <laughs> I would well, love to As soon to as to you Eric said Clapton. that you live down there. Yeah. Thought, yeah. And then another question I have, uh, like Jean was asking it as far as a wheelchair. Jean had to use a wheelchair after her injury in the army. And what we got was, it's a very unique chair. It's not one that you self-push. You have mm -hmm. to be propelled by someone. But there, are, it reclines. Oh. Because Jean also couldn't be upright for too long without yeah. being uncomfortable or passing out. So it reclines. And what the thing that I liked about it the most was... Um, because I felt like a wheelchair, then you you know, like, you do you need a wheelchair accessible vehicle? It comes apart and it's aluminum. So it's okay. very lightweight because um, the the designer had watched um, someone trying to put a wheelchair in their trunk in a rainstorm and was like, there has got to be a better way. Right. It's so very it lightweight. The whole thing comes apart. And um, same thing, if you're going to go on an airplane, you can take it apart and put it in the overhead bin. That's well, a really good thing. idea. No, not the whole thing. A lot of the parts that can right, break, right. you put in the overhead right. bin. Um, so we'll we'll send you information on that too. Yeah, okay. we will. My husband is military. Yeah. We're stationed at Scott. Oh, so um, oh my that, that was my last duty station. Oh my oh, god! You're our new. You are our new favorite person. Oh, <laughs> uh, what what branch of the service is he in? He is Air Force, active duty Air Force. Okay. I. I, I I would have to assume that because the majority it's, of people there. It is there, an Air Force yeah. base. However, there's also a joint base Combined, there, so, uh, yeah. U.S. So, yeah. Transcom, and that's where yeah. I worked as an Army officer. So okay, yeah, oh, no, yeah. that's where we're at. Awesome, amazing. And I will say also, um, in St. Louis is one of my favorite art museums. So um, they have a great art yeah. museum. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. I like the art museum yeah, because I feel like I can go there sometimes, and I can just walk mm -hmm. and then sit. And then walk. Yes. And then sit. And it's yes. air conditioned because it's it can yes. be extremely unpleasant here, as you yes. probably are aware. Yes. It's like swimming. Very, very much. <laughs> yeah, the humidity right. is pretty rough. The humidity is terrible. Um, Audrey, you were mentioning your your family um, has been supportive and your brothers and your husband and your parents have been supportive. What role have your friends and family played in your healthcare journey? Um they have been absolutely amazing. Um, I like, I have had friends, I'm from Kansas. I've had friends that have flown out to St. Louis um, to help me go to doctor's appointments and stuff because my husband was deployed. I have um, friends that check in on me regularly just to make sure that like my spirits are up because I can't really do much and leave my house or anything. 
Um, my mom has come, I think, six separate times to St. Louis to help with doctor's appointments. Um, my brothers and my dad all like check in on me regularly, which I just, I can't be more thankful for the way that I have been supported about all of that. Um, it's, it can be hard, I think, for people when you have a friend or a loved one that is going through a, um, basically a huge life change. Like I was a super mm -hmm. active person that did all these different things all the time. Um, and now I'm not that person anymore. And it can be, you know, super easy to kind of like, okay, well, you know, Audrey can't do that anymore. So like, I don't think we should even tell her about it. But instead, people have been mm -hmm. very, very willing to like, how can I make it so that you can still yeah. be involved yeah. in any and every activity that we would want to do? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just extremely thankful for that. Yeah. Yeah, kudos to them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Audrey, what are you looking forward to doing next year? Um, well, I am starting, I'm going back to grad school uh, to become a clinical mental health, health counselor, hopefully. Excellent. Excellent. Um, it's something that it's a job that I could hopefully potentially do without having to, you know, be necessarily 40 hours a week full time and right, still right. help other people that might be going through transitions like mine. Um, so that's one thing I'm excited for. Uh, another thing that um, I'm excited for is my husband and I are obviously legally married, but we haven't had a wedding. So we're supposed to be having, we're having a wedding. So Oh, and nice. I'm excited nice. for that. Yeah, and, COVID kind of put. Um, yeah. Yeah, and he got orders right kind of in the middle of that time. So, you know. Okay. Yep. We PCS. It, it's difficult to, it's difficult to, uh, to be a family Schedule person. Life. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just looking forward to finding more ways of being able to do things. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm a very creative person, so I can typically I'm like, well, what if we tried it this way? Um, I mm -hmm. think that, that has really helped me through all of this is like, for example, um, we want to go to New Orleans. My husband's never been to New Orleans. I've been multiple times It's like, well, I think that if we do it this way, like if we drive and we go to these certain places and, you know, take a streetcar and stay at this location, then it will probably be OK. Um, so I think that sort of thing, kind of trying to come up with more creative ways of doing things. Is right, right. Something I'm I know Jean was, Jean was telling me recently how much it, it meant to my dad on one oh, of the outings yeah. that, that I took him on because it, as he was getting on in, in his years, he had a really bad heart condition and he could hardly walk 10 feet without mm -hmm. getting winded. So I rented him one of those electric wheelchairs mm -hmm. you, and, and yeah. he could propel himself, which he thought was the cat's meow. Oh, he had so much fun. And uh, he said, I never would have done it. I never would have even thought of doing right. it. And you can rent them in a lot of locations. Mm -hmm. so right. When you get Major there, cities. Um, made, although can, right. New Orleans, I don't know, because there's a lot of cobblestone and yeah. it might be a bumpy ride. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah. that might be a way that you can... Yeah. Visit more places and Visit do more, more things. Visit more places so. and do more things yeah. and, and feel more independent because mm -hmm. yeah. you're kind of in control with that little button. Mm -hmm. And same thing, yeah. I think in Florida, they rent um, wheelchair accessible vans at the airport yeah. and you can rent the electric wheelchair and yeah, all of that. Right. Okay. What role has self-care played in your journey since you've had this uh, diagnosis? Um, that one has actually been a little bit challenging because it's, I feel like everybody has to be involved in everything. And I was a very independent person. But mm -hmm. one thing like I really kind of embraced is like, for example, showering is not always the easiest thing when mm -hmm. you're wobbly. So I've mm -hmm. really like we have a really nice bathtub and I really embrace the bath like you have all the bubbles, you have like the salts. You know, you sit in there, you soak, you might read your book. So I've like, that's like my like, you know, ritual is I have this really nice bath. 
Um, I've also sort of leaned into more creative things like painting and doing like knitting and embroidery and stuff that I previously enjoyed, but just didn't spend much time doing. So like kind Mm -hmm. of like finding, I have the time now and I can still use like my hands to do stuff like that. Mm Um, Mm -hmm. Another thing that I've really recently found that I really enjoy is that there's, it's like, it's through Lululemon, like the athletic company, it's called Lululemon Mm -hmm. Studio. It's an app that you can put Mm -hmm. on your phone and like they have hundreds of workouts that you can do, maybe even thousands, but you can put in there, like, I need a workout that's like slow, that I'm either just lying down or just sitting down, um, that doesn't use any equipment, that's 15 minutes long, and it will give you different activities. Like, okay, here's like a workout for you to like, just move your arms a little bit in a chair Mm -hmm. for 15 minutes. And yeah, right. Like, to me, that's really awesome. Because it's like all, it's Mm -hmm. hard to like, find the motivation or the like, even like the mental capacity to come up with like, that kind of thing on your own and I'm not going to mm-hmm. go to a workout class anywhere <laughs> right I and a die. lot of the videos online it goes there you know, it's like, all about going from standing to you're doing work on the ground and then you're back up again yeah, and, yeah. right right and they're like mm-hmm. built to yeah. be like 30 45 minutes and mm-hmm. you know that's that's maybe in the future but definitely not right, right. now mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. are so, there any craft groups there on base um i don't like mwr there probably are i live in collinsville so i'm kind of halfway between base and Mm st louis which is actually great Mm -hmm. because i go to barnes jewish for almost everything and barnes jewish is absolutely Mm -hmm. phenomenal but if we were on base it'd be like a really long drive it's like 40 minutes depending on the shenanigans of st louis traffic right Um, that's where lita donated a kidney Mm -hmm. oh wow Good for mm-hmm. you. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. She likes that hospital. I uh, There is a museum in St. Louis that I was doing some docent volunteering at called the Campbell House Museum. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. But I have recently started doing transcription of letters from a family that used to live there. So that's a thing that I'm oh. enjoying doing. Okay. That's very cool. Yeah. yeah. If, if you can read cursive from, you know, the 18, 19. If you go like, you have to go like this. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I think the um, National Archives occasionally will ask for people to um, assist mm-hmm. with things of that nature, too. Yeah. yeah. Um, Audrey, what advice do you have for someone who's been recently diagnosed with sick sinus syndrome? Uh, I think the most important thing is for you to feel at peace with your own health. So like if you need Mm -hmm. to make changes to make yourself be healthier, or if you Mm -hmm. like, like, for example, I felt when I was diagnosed, I went through sort of a period of like wondering what I could have changed or what I could have done differently or what I need to change or do differently to ensure that I'm healthier for the rest of my life. Um, So if there's changes or shifts that you need to do to have that peace, I think that that's really important, but I also think that um, it's really important to realize that we live in a world and an environment in the U.S. that is very well set up in general for people that have health issues. Most of the world is not set up for people with any kind of disability. Um, I mean, for example, if you go to Europe, You can't really go much of anywhere because everything's cobblestone and wobbly and everything. But like here, Mm -hmm. most places have some sort of option for a handicapped person. Um, Yeah, the uh, the American with Disabilities Act has has made it very, very easy for individuals. Most of the time. Yeah. 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 It's not always, Mm -hmm. but most of the time. And like, just like lean into that. You don't have mm-hmm. to stop living. You don't have to give up. You just have to kind of modify the way that you do things. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, you have to, like, give yourself grace. You have to be like, okay, it's okay if I don't feel well enough to do that. That's fine. I don't have to feel bad about it. I just can not feel that well today. I don't have to, like, right. feel 
upset or like super apologize to people because my body's not working as well today as it was yesterday. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that that is really important. I also think that something that I've found to be helpful is that if you're not getting the answer from a doctor that you feel is what you want or what you feel is accurate for your health condition, go to a different doctor. I initially mm -hmm. had a doctor that had my pacemaker set on essentially factory settings. So it was not going to do any of the things that it needed to do to help me. Like it was going to help me a little oh, bit, wow. but not significantly. So, yeah. um, and that was because I was going to a cardiologist, which is, you know, right. we think that that's what you need to do. But then I went to an electrocardiologist. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Who knows? That's his whole life is working with the natural right. pacemaker or whatever pacemaker you have. And he has yep. done so much for my ability to do things. That's fantastic. And you sometimes just kind of have to keep pushing your medical providers to try and get to where you think that you need to be for that. Okay. Yeah. You know Good your advice. body best. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, Audrey, thank you very much for joining us today and taking the time to talk with us today. We hope that um, you will enjoy the concert. Um, yeah. How can our listeners learn more about you and sick sinus syndrome? Um, I do have social media. I have an Instagram and a TikTok if they want to follow me on okay. those or go search for me mm -hmm. on those. Um, I'm Audramus Rex, A-U-D-R-A-M-O-U-S-R-E-X. Um, I share about my different... Um, health journeys on there quite a bit and they can always message me there if they have any questions i am an open book and always willing to talk to people about it um as far as oh, sick sinus syndrome itself i really like looking at the mayo clinic or johns hopkins mm -hmm. which you guys sent me as well but those are my top two mm -hmm. anyway um and often on facebook there are like support groups for almost everything. So you can look mm -hmm. for a support group and sometimes they have really, really helpful things in those. Great. Um, we're we're going to put links on, on uh, the webpage that we developed for this episode. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, I, I might be reaching out to get those, uh, those links from you. Mm -hmm. Okay. But thank you very much, Audrey. It's been of a course. real pleasure talking with you today. And thank, thank you, your, you so um, much. Thank your husband for his service. We appreciate that. And, Thank um, you, guys. Yeah. Thanks. If our listeners have any questions or comments about today's show, they can contact us at podcastdx at yahoo.com. And if you have a moment to spare, please give us a review wherever you get your podcast. As always, please remember that this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment, and always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Um, or treatment or and before undertaking a new healthcare regime and never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you've heard on your, this podcast. Till next week. Oh.